So everybody, welcome to System Crafters Live. I'm David Wilson, and we're back again with another another Friday stream where we get together as a community and talk about whatever uh, idea I've come up with for the week. And uh, this week we got a another uh, little stream that we're gonna discuss some things and see uh, what kind of interesting stuff gets out of it or comes out of it. Obviously, you can see that I'm a little rusty on this because it's been two weeks since the last stream. I apologize for that for those of you who are looking for stream. I guess last week and the week before last. Uh, it's been a little bit crazy, but we'll get into why and uh, talk about it a little bit. So uh, I'd like to say hello to Alejandro, uh, Mitch, Mark, uh, Amovedia, uh, Vim, Gun. Nice to see you all. Thanks so much for being here. Milan is revenge. I am Dongwell. Thank you. Hello to Daigo. Let's see. So let's just jump right into it. So resetting the system. Once again, one of my patented sort of... Um, weird titles to, to get you interested in what we're going to talk about today. Uh, today we're going to hang out and discuss some ideas that I have for the channel going forward. And just right up front, I'm going to say no the channel's not going anywhere. I'm actually thinking a lot about what things I want to do, uh, you know, video topics, how I want to deal with live streams, um, that kind of thing. So we're going to sort of talk all together about like what types of things we want to see in the channel this year, uh, since, you know, we've already lost about, mm, let's say a good third of the year without too many videos. So uh, we're gonna try to make up for that by uh, doing some kick-ass videos for the rest of the year. Hello to Thomas, Luis, Michael, Gavin, and to uh, Fat Finger Death Crunch and Star7. Nice to see you back, uh, Star7. All right, so first of all, uh, what happened? I mean, why has there been such a lack of videos on the channel this year? I mean, I've, I've sort of mentioned this a few times by now, but let's talk about it in a little bit more detail. Um, it's a combination of factors. Uh, first of all, I didn't really spend a whole lot of time working on my own configuration this year. Um, it, the thing about system crafting is that at some point, you're probably going to end up with a system, uh, a configuration that is fairly stable for you for your day to day use that you don't really need to tweak with, you know, new packages or try to figure anything out. And that's sort of the situation I got myself into. Now, that's not to say that I feel like what I've got is perfect. In fact, it's far from perfect. There's a lot of things I need to fix. But it had gotten to such a comfortable state, especially with the fact with geeks that I don't really have to update packages very often. So I just kind of left things as they were, and just use my system happily, you know, Emacs, EXWM, etc. No problems. So, you know, I've, I've been just using things just fine the way that I do every single day. And when you don't actually keep looking into new stuff to try, then you don't really have a lot to talk about in terms of, you know, new packages that you're looking into or new strategies for configuration management or anything like that, that we normally would talk about on this channel. So it's kind of difficult for me to come up with topics for, um, new videos whenever I'm not really even thinking about configuration or not really thinking about hacking my Emacs config. So I don't know, it that made it really difficult to get back into that headspace and make videos about things, especially like the Emacs videos that I wanted to be making about, you know, uh, the new Emacs from scratch series or anything else related to that. Um, so that's something I'm going to change. I've got a lot more time on my hands now to actually get back into hacking my config and I have been doing it a little bit here and there. Uh, some of the results of that we'll talk about uh, as possible video topics later. Um, but yeah, it's just something that happens every now and then. I think anybody who's been, you know, dealing with their own custom system configuration over time or over a long enough period of time, you sort of see that there are periods where you just don't really invest too much time into it because it is a hobby. But sometimes other hobbies take precedence. And that's sort of what happened with uh, Flux Harmonic. So I've been talking about that channel for a while. I started doing streams for that channel probably in um, the end of December of last year. 
and you know started off with the intention to only be coding on that project on the streams but then quickly devolved into me coding in most of my free time to make up enough progress to then have something cool to do on the streams twice a week for two hours so um that was a huge time sink that also took me more away from doing system configuration work and uh also made it kind of difficult to think about anything else really because it's just between that and then work and then family life i mean it's just difficult to have the uh the space and time to do anything else really um if you've been following Flux Harmonic recently, you've probably noticed that I've stopped the streams on that, mainly because of all the time I was spending on it and not really making the kind of progress that I wanted to make with the channel. Um, and obviously I was feeling really guilty about not doing anything for System Crafters. So it made it clear to me that I needed to take a step back from that and then rethink how I deal with everything. Uh, and I've sort of been in this weird limbo phase for the last few weeks where after I stopped doing those streams, it's, you have this kind of weird sensation of like, I don't know, lack of motivation because the whole thing you had driving all of your motivation up until that point is now gone. So you're like, well, what do I, what do, I do now? Uh, and it's hard to get sort of back into that. Um, so now that I put that stuff on hold, I'm kind of bored and I'm looking to get back into making System Crackers videos again, again which is a good result, I think. Uh, I do intend to do more stuff for Flix Harmonic, but um, at the moment, it's not really clear what's going to be the best approach, especially in terms of the fact that I don't want to invest all my time on the projects necessary for that channel. So I got to find a good way to balance everything. Um, yeah, Gavin says hard to start once you stop is very hard to start once you stop. Uh, the, the weird thing about momentum for things like, you know, putting out videos every week or streaming every week is that it is hard to get into momentum. But once you get into a momentum, it's hard to get out of it. But then if you ever happen to get out of it, like if you go on vacation for a few weeks and then you come back, then it's really hard to get back into it again, especially if you have like feelings of guilt or anything about not doing it. So super, super complicated, uh, this whole lifestyle of making YouTube videos and streaming regularly. Uh, there's a lot of mental game that goes into it that is probably not easy to understand unless you have been doing it for a while. So I know Gavin knows what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, it's been sort of a weird period of time for me this year, like, you know, working really hard on, on a different channel and then trying to get everything back together for this channel, but I'm feeling motivated and inspired to work on stuff. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today. Um, also, um, these streams every Friday have been great because they've helped us to keep sort of in contact while I wasn't making videos for a while. Um, but you know, over the last six to nine months, the streams has sort of eaten up a lot of the content ideas I would have actually made videos about. Some of the, you know, checking out uh, particular packages or programs or comparing things. All that stuff would have been great videos, I think, and they would have been a lot more well organized and put together. And maybe you would have gotten something out of them in a shorter time frame instead of like a two hour video. So um, I've been thinking a lot about how I want to use the stream time that we have on Fridays so that I don't feel like I have to come up with some elaborate topic, which is difficult when you already have to come up with another video every week. So uh, it's it's something we need to, to, to think about because I really, really enjoy these streams. I enjoy interacting with all of you. I think it's an important part of this channel and the community. It's just a matter of you know figuring out the right way to use the streams so that um, I'll have more things that I can make videos about. Because I think, you know, with all the time I was spending streaming on flux harmonic and you know the streams on this channel as well what i've learned over time is that if you want to get a message across or if you want to teach somebody a piece of information a stream is not necessarily the best way to do that because most people aren't willing to sit through a two-hour stream and even if you edit up a stream recording to make it shorter it, it doesn't have the right flow because you're sort of just doing things on the fly or um maybe you're not explaining yourself so well because you're not following a script so um, I would rather use streams as a way to just interact with the community and the, ch and the people who watch this channel rather than try to, you know, discuss things that are probably better used in a video. So I don't know. It's, I thought a lot about a lot of this stuff over the last few months, and I'm coming to the conclusion that streams should, should have a very specific purpose and it shouldn't be to, um, cover things I would rather cover as a video. And then lastly, I mean, 
what was it like seven months ago I moved to Greece and um, it's been great it's also been very difficult for various reasons that I won't go into <laughs> mainly just because of bureaucracy and you know uh, legal paperwork and stuff and also finding the house but um, you know that whole process has also been sort of destabilizing to the family setup and the um, you know my working setup because I'm working on a tiny desk I don't have my own house in my own office yet which I will soon which is gonna be awesome but um, it's difficult to be motivated to go record videos whenever you don't really have a good setup though I have to say uh, I have been streaming like a madman uh, over the last four months so it didn't really stop me from doing that um, yeah and I've also been you know working at the same time but I'm working remotely with a company in the US and I have to you know do meetings at weird hours like at night all the time so I don't know it's just been an, a, a long adjustment period and all of that stuff sort of came to the, the result that uh, making System Crafters videos has not been as much of a priority, but um, I am definitely going to change that because, you know, I'm, I've been so impressed with how many people are still coming to the channel and uh, being excited, learning about Emacs and learning about geeks and uh, people who are involved in the community. You know, even though I haven't really been as involved on IRC and Discord, the same people are still there chatting every day, uh, which I really appreciate. Um, and uh, it seems like, you know, things have been going on smoothly just without me being that involved, but I want to make up for that now and sort of get really re-engaged and um, uh, sort of take things to the next level, I guess you could say. You know, do more work building the community and uh, more work trying to figure out exactly what kind of stuff people want to see on this channel so that you all get the most value you can out of it. Because at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do is teach people things and uh, I want to do a really good job at that, so... Time to get back on that whole thing. So let's see. Also, hello to Alejandro. Uh, Alejandro says, nice light. Is it natural? It's a mixture of natural plus uh, these two LED lights that are beaming me in the face right now. Uh, hello to Cesar, Mark, uh, Dexplorer, Drashal, John. Nice to see you. All right. So with all that out of the way, I know it's kind of weird doing these kinds of videos or streams where you kind of feel like you're apologizing for things people don't really like watching them because it's kind of weird um sorry about that but i do want to be transparent with people because you know i have people who are supporting me on you know github sponsors and patreon and uh, people who are you know following the channel for a while and i just want to make sure that people know that i i really care about what i've you know what, what we've been doing here and continuing that so you know sometimes it's, it's good to just uh, clear the air and make things uh clear all right, so let's talk about uh, what kind of video topics that I would like to make and also what kind of things that you would like to see. Uh, I got a, like a pretty big list of ideas here, but I also want to hear your thoughts on things that maybe I haven't thought about yet that uh, fit into this whole realm of system crafting or even sort of related programming stuff or anything like that because um, we focus a lot on Emacs on this channel. Like I would say 80% of the content has been Emacs. And then there's been a, another fair portion that's been geeks, but we haven't really stepped outside of those topics a whole lot. And we won't really like go away from Emacs and geeks because really that's the core of everything that I do uh, with my own configuration. But I do want to experiment with other tools and uh, sort of flesh out the information around other parts of you know the experience of using GNU Linux and other things that you might be interested to use if you aren't as invested in Geeks or Emacs as I am and as some of the other people on this channel are. So, hey Jeff, Johan, and uh, Terrace. Um, so let's talk about possible topics. Obviously, we need to continue the Emacs from scratch uh, V2 series. Um, I think I only got about two videos into that and it also sort of overlaps a little bit with the Emacs Essential series I was doing last year. Uh, I, I'm i starting to feel like series are not the best way to go. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of interesting for encapsulating sort of an end-to-end -end experience on something, but um, sometimes it's good to let a video live on its own as an independent piece of content, or at least an independent tutorial on something. And um, I'm trying to make sure that every installment I do in that series actually is enough that enough standalone and interesting on its own that you don't really have to feel like you're watching a whole series just to get to that point. So I asked about um, key bindings on uh, the community post. Uh, maybe was it last week? Can't remember what day that was, but I got a lot of feedback on that. Thank you all to to those of you who responded. 
And uh, that's a good example of something that I wanna do the right way. It's very easy just to go into a video just talking about using global set key and define key and just the normal key binding stuff. But um, I feel like that a video about that by itself is not very interesting. It, I think it's gonna be more interesting if I give more context and application of the information that you probably didn't expect. And one of the things that people mentioned a lot uh, in the responses uh, to that, that question, <clears throat> excuse me, is that um, people have a hard time, uh, number one, knowing uh, sort of what patterns they should use for defining their own key bindings. And number two, even remembering which key bindings they set up and like, you know, b burning it into their muscle memory. So where I had written like an about 80% of a video on Emacs key bindings, now I'm having to rethink that and make a video that's more about like, how do you just manage key bindings yourself? Like, how do you come up with what key bindings that you want to use? And how do you, you know, make yourself use them, I guess. And that's a lot more interesting than just calling define key and, and creating uh, key maps. So this is the kind of thing that I'm trying to do going forward. I don't want to be like a series where it's sort of conceived end to end. And um, most of the people only watch the first video and don't watch the rest. I want to, I want everybody to get value out of every single video to the extent that it's unique. So um, any thoughts people have to that to that end, I'm certainly uh, open to hear them. <clears throat> um, Alejandro says, maybe evaluate rational Emacs development. Well, I definitely need to get back into that because uh, I, that's another area that I've been very impressed with uh, as I've been sort of disconnected from things. That project, rational Emacs, has actually been progressing and people are still con uh, contributing to it. And uh, Jeff and John have been doing a great job of, of shepherding that project, uh, Jeff Bowman and John Eastman here. And uh, uh, people like Alejandro and others have been uh, contributing to it. So thank you all very much for, for working on that. We definitely need to go and look back over it again uh, very soon, probably on a stream, because that's a great thing to do on a stream. Uh, Gunn says, I'd like to see a wrap up of all the completion mini buffer list stuff like I do Helm select and Vertigo. Yes, that's definitely a good idea. So um, let's see cover more of the various completion systems, especially built in ones like I do, uh, et cetera. <coughs> uh, uh, Amal says, uh, the original EFS series was incredibly useful to me. I've watched it end to end, but I also go back to individual videos as need be. And I think there's a lot of value you can derive from those even as standalone videos. Yeah, I try to make them more or less like that the first time through. But um, they're also like one hour long each, which is a little bit daunting to people. I, you know, I hear various different things. Some people say they love the, the one hour long videos, like the stream recordings. And others say that they can't watch a video that long. So uh, I'm trying, I, I keep saying, I keep, I'm trying to like make shorter videos that have just as much value. And I think that's the right way to go because, um, well, yeah, it, because, you know, if you, most people don't have a whole lot of time. Now, the reason why I pause there for a second is because I do see a trend of extremely long videos on YouTube. I don't know if you've seen it before, but there are like three and a half hour videos on things like the Elder, Scro Elder Scrolls Daggerfall. Actually, I think that video may be four hours long. I also watched a video um, about Twin Peaks that I think was two and a half hours long recently. So. Maybe the whole short video thing isn't really well-founded. Um, people will watch long stuff, but for tutorial videos, maybe it's uh, a better thing to do. Uh, Gavin says, timestamps are the, the only way to make long videos work in my experience. Yeah, timestamps are critical. Some of the older videos don't have timestamps, but pretty much all the newer ones do. Let's see, uh, Matias says, long vids are great. Uh, Gun says org deserves a series on its own. Yeah, I need to go back and cover org in more detail. I think that's something that's really missing from the channel. And it does sort of fit into the whole idea that, you know, <coughs> system crafting is as much about workflow and even productivity as it is about just tinkering with the computers. So org mode really fits in in terms of using it for personal productivity, project planning, that kind of thing. So I do want to get more into that and even try to come up with like an end-to-end -end productivity system using org mode um, as a challenge for myself and also just something that might be useful to people. Uh, so I'd like to do that at some point. 
Uh, Dexplorer says, I'd love to see more content about integration of Emacs and Markdown. That's interesting. Um, Gavit says, I forgot I was working on a, that Corfu module. Hopefully someone made it better alternative and merged it. I don't think they did yet, but uh, you, you should check that out again if you get a chance. Uh, Alejandro says, mode line. Yeah, that's definitely going to be part of the, uh, the EFS V2 series because, you know, EFS V2 is more about like doing things that are in the box and not using external packages. So uh, instead of using do mode line, we got to figure out how to configure the mode line ourselves. Uh, Michael says, I'd like to see a video on optimizing key bindings to minimize leaving the home row while programming. It would also be great to figure out effective key map layers. Yeah, that's something that I like to do with my key bindings is to set up things up so that I'm using like HJKL, semicolon, etc. like that to for my main key binding. So that's something I would definitely uh, talk about. Alejandro says, tutorial, short ones, discussion videos, larger. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Alejandro says, EFS, no magic. Yeah, that would be, I mean, VC mode is usable. It's not great, or at least I feel like it's uh, way less usable than magic, so. Uh, Amal says, any chance you'd be interested in doing videos on systems programming? Yeah, I've been writing a lot of C code this year. Um, I I need to try it and see if people would be interested in seeing more about it. And I need to figure out exactly what it means to say systems programming. Probably Linux systems programming because that you know would, would be relevant to people here. Um... I learned a lot about, uh, you know, calling into Linux APIs and whatnot while working on Mesh for the uh, Flux Harmonic channel. And um, it's interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, seeing that kind of thing. Um, if you haven't really done low level programming before. So that's something I'm interested in, in talking about at some point. Uh, Smoog says, in be interested in seeing something like Awesome WM. Yeah, I, I want to talk about window managers more for sure. Michael Rose says Linux from scratch would be uh, awesome. Yeah, uh, yeah. let's talk about that in a second. Okay, so I did say, um, <coughs> excuse me, org mode and org roam. I don't know what I was saying here recovering, but let's just take that out. Uh, covering other window managers that uh, and what workflow benefits they might have. So obviously I'm kind of a diehard EXWM user. I have experimented with other window managers like StumpWM recently. And, you know, always ended up coming back to EXWM, even though there are definite issues that I have with it. And the development on the project isn't moving, really isn't moving, period, even though it there's some activity on the repos these days. Um, uh, the the, the new, new maintainer responds to issues here and there, but really, I don't think anybody's getting PRs merged. So uh, I would like to experiment with other window managers on the channel. There's one that I've been looking at recently called Herbstluft uh, WM. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Please tell me if there's a better way to say it. Um, but that one and BSPWM that Alejandro mentioned, they're very interesting to me because of the way that you configure them. Um, it's not like i3 where you have a configuration file that has its own syntax uh, with Herbstluft and, uh, with, and BSPWM. They actually have a command line application that you call to configure all the options and even interact with the running window manager. And you can use any scripting language you want to invoke that command. So you can write your configuration for those window managers however you want. So um, I I find those cur sort of like a curiosity and um, I think they're interesting to talk about. So I will make some videos on that kind of thing at some point. Um, now, that's not to say that I'm going to end up changing my the window manager that I use, but you know, part of the, the goal of this channel is not just to tell you how to use Emacs and Geeks. It's also to say like what your other options are. It, like maybe you don't want to use EXWM, maybe you want to use something else. It'd be cool to have uh, videos on other window managers. Now, window managers are a topic that have been covered at length on other Linux channels, and I would like to do it differently than those channels do. Typically, a Linux channel will do like a drive-by coverage of a particular program. Like, here's a you know video about Herbstluff WM. Uh, here's what it looks like. Here's my configuration that I made with it. Here you go. Um, I would like to go into a little bit more depth than that because I feel like 
it's all cool to sort of see something you haven't seen before, but if you don't really know how to try it, then you're not going to get the benefit out of it. So I don't know. Um, I think that I want to experiment with that and see how, what we can do with it. Uh, Alejandro says BSPWM in Emacs Lisp possible but efficient. Um, well, I mean, if you're using any language to shell out to a command line tool to talk to the window manager over IPC, I mean, you're going to pay the cost of shelling out, but I don't think it's so bad. Um, so yeah, you could definitely configure BSPWM with Emacs. I would, I don't think there'd be any problem with that. Gun says invite DT for a guest session on Haskell and Xmonad. Well, I wouldn't be very useful in that because I don't know Haskell and I have not used uh, Xmonad. Um, sorry, I can't uh, read your name, but you, you ask, uh, if you did not do it already, I would be happy to see how you made your website with Emacs. I have the beginnings of a series about that, which I should probably get back to. Let's see, finish, or let's see, more videos on uh, websites with org mode. So I do have videos on that. I can't remember the name of the series, uh, but if you look at my video list, um, you'll see it. Uh, Tomas says, uh, Herbst Luff doesn't seem to have any Wayland support. Is, uh, is a window manager is independent of whether you run it on Wayland or X11? No, it's, it's definitely tied to which, um, what do you call it even? Windowing system? Not really windowing system. Um, yeah, but yes, Herbst Luff is for X11, um, and Wayland window managers are basically the entire compositor program all wrapped into one thing. So it's this is sort of like a different model. In X11, you can run a window manager and it's sort of like a program that runs alongside X11. But in Wayland, you're sort of writing a pro your window manager is a program that talks to Wayland protocol, but it's sort of it is like the the running um, desktop environment session. So it's, there's no separation. Display server. Yeah, I think that's right, John. Thanks. display server indeed thanks t so um yeah different thing entirely uh, and i had mentioned that i want to get uh into wayland and, and you know cover some wayland window managers and i definitely will do that um i need to get a better streaming recording setup going first so that whenever i crash when i inevitably crash the window manager i don't take down the stream with me um uh, i i have the ability to do that right now, but for some reason, whenever I have this particular USB-C hub plugged into my laptop, it kills my Wi-Fi. So a very strange situation with that. <laughs> and that's prevented me from doing other videos where I have like a separate computer and um, I can do whatever I want, crash it as many times as I want, and the stream doesn't go down. So soon I'll have the ability to do those things. Uh, Gunn says, uh, apply W.R. Stevens uh, APUE book to Linux programming videos chapter by chapter. That's interesting. I'll have to look that up. Gavin says, systems programming means literally anything these days. If a language isn't very featureful and leaves lots of room for errors, you are now systems programming. Welcome to the world of Golang. Um, yeah, it's an interesting point. I mean, for me, I consider systems programming to be in the realm of like C and Zig and even Rust. Go is sort of like more in the middle because it does have a garbage collector. But I mean, does having a garbage collector really exclude you from being a system, systems programming language? Um, I guess you could say that a language that compiles down to a native binary could be considered a systems language because you're creating an actual binary and not just running with an interpreter. But I don't know. It's sort of a, a gray area to begin with. Um, at least with C, C++, et cetera, you can call directly into the APIs that are exposed by uh, the system through the header files and libraries that are there on the system. And through other programming languages, you usually have to go through like a wrapper layer that uh, isn't directly calling into those things. I don't know if that's a way that you would consider it to be a systems programming language, but I don't know. Gun says, all in KNRC. KNRC is pretty... Uh, old by this point, isn't it? Isn't it like the, like the 1989 standard or even like the 99 standard? Uh, Gavin says, I was mostly making a joke because Go calls itself a systems programming language. I mean, they can sort of get away with it. I don't know. Uh, Amal says, a display buffer A-list video would be cool too. Not quite a WM, but maybe a similar idea. Yeah, I never got back to doing that. I was going to make a video on that, but I didn't do it. So thanks for reminding me. Uh, let me see here. Uh, video about display buffer A-list. Okay. 
So let's see what else. Uh, Michael says, I'd like to see more uh, depth with window managers as well. Some have uh, powerful customization features, but I almost never see users move beyond the rising stage and move into optimizing workflows. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's sort of what I want to do. But the problem with that is that it, it kind of requires you to, it requires me to spend some time um, learning a window manager and thinking about how I would use it to provide that kind of insight. And um, the thing that you find out whenever you talk to other people who do, you know, system crafting, etc., is that people will have very different workflows than you do, and they will tell you about things that you had never thought about before. So uh, I, it's probably a good idea for me to like consult with the community about a particular thing before I make a video about it, like a w window manager maybe other people have uh, familiarity with, so that I don't have to like really spend a whole lot of time digging deeply and learning all the nooks and crannies. Um, because, you know, we need to be able to make videos every week, so we can't be like spending a whole month learning a window manager. All right. Uh, Gun says C89 came afterwards. Uh, someone else says, what about a vlog describing your profile? Um, yeah, well, I've been thinking a little bit about maybe like vlog style con uh, content. I'm not exactly sure the best way to do that on this channel. S you know, one thing I've been thinking to myself uh, for a while now is I need to uh, get out of the box. Like you see me right now, I'm sort of in the box. I'm inside of Emacs. You see my, my head floating in the screen and it might be interesting for me to not be in this setting all the time while I'm making videos. Like maybe, you know, I'll go outside and, you know, be uh, an actual human being, but also talk about the topics we talk about on this channel. Um, I don't know exactly how well people will like that. And it sort of gets not so much as a tutorial style video as a mixture of tutorial and uh, something else, but uh, it could be interesting to, to talk about that. And, and try it out. Let's see. All right. What else did I have in this list? Um, Linux audio systems. This is kind of an interesting topic. Uh, not too many people go into depth on this outside of just using whatever is a part of their system. I mean, pulse audio is the most common thing these days uh, built on top of the ALSA sound system. But uh, Pipewire is a new emerging standard, and I think it's pretty awesome. I actually am using Pipewire on this system right now. I don't use Pulse Audio anymore. Uh, and I also don't use Jack because Pipewire can take the place of that too. So uh, doing some discussion on the various different Linux audio systems, why they exist, why they were created, uh, and maybe how to set up Pipewire and or Jack could be pretty interesting on this channel, I think. Because if you want to do uh, streaming or... Uh, any kind of uh, video or music production, more than a, more than likely you'll end up having to use something like Jack. You don't have to use Jack for streaming. Obviously, you can just use you know Pulse Audio and what's in your system. But uh, anything more complicated, you will end up using something like Jack. Like let's say you want to try to route audio from a particular program into OBS uh, and not hear it in your headphones. Things like that, Jack is really good for. So um, that could be a pretty interesting uh, set of videos. I don't know how well they will be received in terms of like whether people will watch them but i've seen other channels talk about pipewire and it's done pretty well so uh, it could be something worth doing um alternate session managers especially console driven ones this one's kind of um interesting i I've, I've been seeing more of a trend i don't know if it's a trend is the right word for this but i've been seeing more of these types of programs recently where uh you know you like if you log into let's say ubuntu or even on my own machine, you know, you log in, you have like a graphical login screen. Um, so there are different programs called session managers or login managers or display managers that um, take this role of being the place where you log in and then launching whichever one of the window managers or desktop environments that you want it to launch. Um, it, to me, like it kind of feels a little bit wasteful to have like another program showing a bunch of stuff on the screen and then launching into your desktop environment. And other people obviously have thought the same way because uh, they've created console-based uh, session managers where you just, it's almost like a login screen, like a prompt, but uh, you can log in just at, at a terminal and then it will launch whatever desktop environment you want. Now, you, you can easily say, well, why not just, you know, log into your TTY and then run start X? Well, it, you know, depending on how your system is set up, like if you're using Geeks, it's not so easy. Like you can't just use start X on Geeks, unfortunately. 
Um, and if you're using a Wayland window manager, you can just run a Wayland window manager from the command line, no problem. You can just run it and it just starts right up. So it may not be entirely necessary to use one of these, but it's something that might be interesting to take a look at. So it's something I'm interested to, to try to make a video about and see what people uh, think about. Uh, Smug says, LY is a lovely TUI uh, login manager that I use. That's cool. I have to take a look at that one. Let's see. Uh, where is that one? Uh, LY. All right. So I'll, I'll write that one down. Uh, SXEZ. Is that are those real ones? Sometimes you can never know with the names of programs. Uh, Alejandro says, I actually only use the default TTY login. Yeah, I mean, there is sort of like a a nice feeling to using just the, the TTY login and then running StartX because, you know, it feels more like, you know, you're back in the 90s era computing. You don't have all the, um, ah, okay. You don't have all the uh, fancy graphical environments yet, so... Uh, Aria says, QPW graph is really cool. I'm not sure which one that is. Maybe that, oh, it's like a Pipewire graph program. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, and uh, Buildings Angst said, audio would be really interesting indeed. Cool. So I'm glad to hear that people uh, are interested in that possibility. A case, nice to see you. Um, what else? Uh, Gun says, potluck, cooking with system crafters. Yeah, I'm not really much of a cook. I'm more like a technician. My wife knows a bunch of different things she likes to make, and I know exactly like what steps I need to take to help her, but I'm not a cook. All right, let's see what else we got here in the chat. All right, so uh, Krishna says, would you like to also do a deep dive into NeoVim and Lua 2? I don't know. I mean... Other channels like Gavin's have covered NeoVim a lot. And if you really want to see a lot of sort of high octane NeoVim content, go check out uh, the Primogen. Uh, hey, Alex. But uh, yeah, I don't know how interested I am in talking about NeoVim specifically. I am sort of interested in talking about Vim and modal editing because I think it, as a concept, it's pretty interesting. But I don't know that I would ever go to the extent that I would try to show how to configure and customize Vim or NeoVim because I personally don't see myself using them. Uh, I'm sort of settled with Emacs at this point, so uh, it's, it's not likely that I would cover a different editor at length. Only if people were like really, really wanted to see it, and I don't know that on this channel uh, if people want to see that. Uh, Tomas says, I loved Evil WN the most. It was a few hundred lines of code, but had good mouse and keyboard support. Yeah, um, I never looked at that one, but, uh, you know, DWM and Rat Poison, I think there's a lot of, you know, minimalistic window managers like that that are really cool. Um, uh, yeah, someone says, you cannot see my name because it's written in Japanese, so your YouTube comment system does not support UTF-8. I think the problem is my machine doesn't have the right fonts necessary to sh to show the characters and even then i wouldn't be able to read it but thank you for uh for for being here i appreciate it I i'm always happy to see people uh from from all the various countries of the world uh coming here because you know we're all geeks we all like you know talking about this stuff it's great nerd bkk says uh you don't have to run start x if you log in uh the window manager will fire up you can automate that with a few lines in bash pro bash profile yeah that's true you could probably do that as long as you can call start X or X init. Um, but I can't do that in geeks, but yeah, that's true. You can, you could have your, uh, your bash profile launch that. Oh, really? Thomas says, uh, DWM and rat poison are like a hundred times bigger than evil WM. Well, I'll have to check out evil WM then. Jeff says Emacs internals might be interesting. Yeah. You know, I did want to cover that. The problem is sometimes, you know, a video like that, won't really be interesting to the majority of people and I'm trying to think about how to best use my time but I will write it down because I want to learn more about the Emacs internal so it might be a good re reason to uh, make a video so um, cover Emacs internals uh, maybe how Emacs Lisp works might be pretty cool actually like how Emacs Lisp works uh, that's a pretty cool video I think um, Alejandro says the internals of native comp that could be cool Let's see, um, cover how Emacs native comp works. All right. Uh, Aria says, uh, Geek system reconfigure is extremely slow compared to Nix OS rebuild. Any way to make it better? I don't know because I think that, 
I don't exactly know why it's slower. I know that probably Guile has something to do with it or just a layer that Geeks has on top of the uh, Nyx build agent already. But that could be a mistaken notion. So I don't exact exactly know why it is slower, but I have heard from people that it is slower. Um, Christian says more short form content shorts maybe. Yeah, I enjoyed making the one short video that I did. Um, shorts are kind of weird. Um, I didn't really get more views on the short, short video that I made. Uh, now that could just be the topic that I had on that one. But typically, whenever you are in the YouTube app and you see the shorts that show up at the bottom of the screen, they're all like 3 million views because there's just some weird boneheaded content that people will click on. So I don't know if Emacs videos work well as a shorts thing. Shabam says, Elisp series. I did one of those. You should check it out. K says, I don't know why YouTube is trying to do stuff. Yeah, YouTube, you know, they, they just want people to click more videos so that more ads get shown. And that's how it works. TikToker. Yeah, I, I also posted that short to TikTok. Nobody on TikTok cares about Emacs. I would be very surprised to see anybody care about Emacs on, on TikTok. Uh, Gavin says, uh, compare uh, native comp with LuaJit and NeoVim for the clicks. So that's an interesting concept. Um, Sean says, perhaps a video on troubleshooting or debugging Emacs list with some examples of good workflow for narrowing down an issue. Um, yeah, you know, I've been meaning to do a video like that for a while and not just like debugging Emacs list code, but like what to do when any error happens in Emacs. There's tools to use for that. So uh, Emacs debugging both uh, for error handling and Emacs list code. Yeah, those definitely are um, big on the list. Yeah, a case says maybe a video about getting your mode line in shape. Yeah, um, definitely I'll do that at, at some point soon because um, as good as Doom mode line is, it would be cool to have my own mode line configuration. Uh, Dave Dunk says, how about the use of E tags? Is that E tags or C tags? Or, oh, E tags, like a C tags for Emacs. I haven't really looked into that, honestly, but that could be possible. Uh, Kay says, I keep meaning to write a package for like easy mode line plus tab bar config. That would be helpful, I think. Gavin says, I've gotten lots of people asking me uh, about project management for org mode. Figure you know more about it than I do. I've done a fair amount with it, but my problem is I can never stick with a system, so I never use it long enough to get a whole lot of value out of it. Uh, T says, I got a missing parenthesis once and took a data find. Use the check parens command. Check P-A-R-E-N-S command. It will tell you exactly where it is. <laughs> Alex uh, had the same reaction that I did. E tags, e -tags immediately made me think of response caching. Yeah. Christian says, for me, learning Emacs list would be fruitful if I can do something other than Emacs in addition to writing config files, maybe some automation using Emacs list. But yeah, you could definitely use Emacs list for scripting, like, you know, shell scripts and whatnot. Um, but anything other than that, like writing an application that you don't use inside of Emacs, I don't know that I would do it. I would use like an actual Lisp or scheme language for that. Damas says, I'm still unclear on font configuration in Emacs, especially how inheritance works and uh, what are the built-in faces, which should be redefined for system-wide effect. Great point. So uh, more details on how faces work in Emacs and knowing which ones to configure. Awesome point. Yeah, I've been meaning to do something on that too, and I forgot about it. I've, I've got notes for possible episodes in like five different places that I can't keep track. That's what happens when you keep trying different note-taking apps or uh, like, you know, org mode files versus org roam files versus log seek versus Dyna list workflow versus Notion. If you try all these different programs, you're going to have notes in 15 different places and you're going to forget where half of them are. Uh, Jen says, Emacs is slow in Microsoft Windows. Yes, indeed. It is very slow and I don't like using it there for that reason. But if you use uh, WSL2, the Windows subsystem for Linux version 2, um, on the latest versions of Windows 11, it's very, very easy to install graphical Emacs inside of like, let's say Debian or Ubuntu running inside of WSL2 and then just run the graphical Emacs and it will pop up as a window on your desktop. That will be running at normal speed uh, as opposed to the Windows version that runs uh, extremely slowly. So that's an option if you have to use Windows and you have access to WSL2 is just run it inside of the Linux environment there and you'll get more speed. Star7 says a video on Modus themes. I actually had been working on something for that. 
um, like customizing the modus themes. I think maybe uh, Silas already has videos on that, but uh, you know, theming with built-in themes, which modus is a built-in theme, uh, I think that's something worth talking about. Patrick says this display buffer a list. Yeah, I've got that on the list. I definitely need to get back to it. Uh, yeah, um, Thomas says Emacs on WSL2, probably worth talking about at some point. I'll just have to like hold my nose and boot into Windows. Uh, Emacs, you didn't hear me say that. Emacs on WSL2. Uh, do you also know how to get rid of the Windows frame? Hmm. I don't think it's possible unless you go into full screen mode. Identifying the challenges when using Emacs on WSL2. Yeah. Let's say like benefits, challenges, etc. There are challenges for sure. People definitely want to see display buffer a list. I may have to do that um, because it's useful and it's one of those sort of esoteric arts of, of Emacs config. Gavin says learning common list. Ha ha ha. No, I'm not going to make videos on that because you're making them. So uh, if you want to learn about common list, go to Gavin's channel because I'm not going to be making common list videos anytime soon. Uh, Aaron says, I was able to get Gen 2 in WSL2, and then I just emerge Emacs like normal, super easy. Yeah, the cool thing about WSL2 is that you can use pretty much, pretty much any distro, Linux distro that you want to use. Um, like Ubuntu, Debian, etc. are already pretty well um, covered there. Uh, it's even possible to get geeks working in WSL2. Actually, mm, yeah, it's, it's possible. Uh, Mini KN wrote a guide on how to do that. It takes a lot of steps because it's not straightforward to get Geeks running, but it is possible to run Geeks in WSL2. Uh, Alejandro says, here we don't use common Lisp. We use a specialized Lisp, Emacs Lisp. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's great for working in Emacs. Arya says that there were some patches for Geeks WSL. Hmm, okay. All right, so what what else do I have here? Uh, looking at data syncing tools like SyncThing and others. I mean, SyncThing, I definitely need to cover it. I use it uh, extensively, and I think it's a great tool. But there's other things that are kind of cool, like uh, GNUnet. I don't know if you ever heard of GNUnet. It's a thing that I haven't really looked into much, but um, it's kind of like a peer-to-peer um protocol which is not really just about like sharing files but it's a lot of other stuff too and uh you know peer-to-peer -peer file sharing is one of the things that can be done there so um i might be interested in, interested to cover that at some point but sync thing is is eminently usable and uh has a very good role in syncing files especially if you install sync thing on your mobile device and you have files being synced from one computer through your phone to another computer pretty cool um, I also mentioned here cover Linux in a deeper way, something like Linux from scratch. I don't think I would go through the full Linux from scratch, but I think it would be kind of interesting to see what it would take to go from just creating a blank partition on a system and then putting enough stuff in there to get Linux to boot. I don't know what, I mean, obviously you need a kernel, you need like uh, libc, you need, um, some the basic sort of layout and files necessary for programs to find what they need. But I don't think you need like a whole distro. It may be possible for a person to just go and set their own Linux system up without using a Linux distribution. So um, something that could be interesting at some point in the future, just as a way to learn what Linux actually is. Um, and obviously the GNU operating system is part of that because either the GNU tools or maybe you would even use something like BusyBox. I mean, you could have all the choices you want at that point. K says literally LFS. Yeah. <laughs> it probably is the same thing in the end. Uh, let's see. Gavin says I'd be interested in setting up a persist server for IRC so I don't lose history, but that's pretty obscure. Yeah, I mean, setting up <clears throat> ZNC is not impossible, but by default, you don't get the kind of settings that you would expect or the kind of features you would expect, like uh, hit, uh, buffer replay when you rejoin channels, that kind of thing. Uh, there are other bouncers I'm interested to look into, like um, Soju, I think it's called, S-O-G-A-U. And uh, that might be a better out-of-the-box experience, but I need to, to, to experiment with some things first. 
Uh, Gun says, Emacs on WSL crashes from time to time if left unattended. Haven't heard of that before. Uh, uh, Barasera, uh, sorry if I mispronounced your name, uh, says, you, can get, you can't get out of Emacs full screen mode in WSL 2. You can get in, but not out. That's pretty awesome, though, because then you're just stuck. You got to use Emacs. Uh, Gavin says, making a video on Emacs might get a decent amount of attention. Possible. Yeah, possible. So, uh, yeah, Matrix server, you know, Matrix is pretty heavyweight as a server protocol. I'm, I've actually set up an XMPP server. I haven't told anybody about it yet. I think Pavel joined it, uh, but nobody else really joined it. And, you know, it's interesting because you can do group chats there and you have person-to-person -person, uh, chats. XMPP is sort of meant for this kind of thing. It could be a, you know, step up from IRC. So I might talk about XMPP at some point. It's, it's, XMPP is actually a really cool protocol and there's a lot of really interesting thinking behind it. There's even a book about XMPP published by O'Reilly that goes into like some of the use cases for XMPP. And, uh, you know, if you've you know heard of Internet of Things or other stuff like that, it fits into a lot of those kind of scenarios. So it could be interesting to talk about that a bit more at some point. In fact, let me put that down because uh, it's cool. Uh, some coverage of XMPP hosting a server, etc. No bridge, just XMPP. Set up a bridge to Discord and make the thumbnail say Discord and Emacs. Yeah, yeah, I know. That, that would be a, a little clicky one. Let's see. Uh, Case says, interview Alpha Papa. That'd be fun. We'll talk about interviewing people in a moment. Let's see. Yeah, I think we've caught up here. I think a lot of these these ideas are other people uh, telling us stuff. So we've covered pretty much all of these things. So um, I've actually put a whole separate section on geeks here because um, there's a lot that I still want to do with geeks that I haven't done yet. And I think there's a growing number of people who are interested in using geeks. And I got quite a lot of views on the geeks video that I, pr that I put out earlier this year, like the whatever number of reasons to use geeks in 2022, whatever I did there. Um, it was surprising how many people watched that video. Now, I imagine that many of those people watched it just to sort of see what Geeks is about, and maybe they decided, eh, not for me. But um, I still feel like, you know, Linux distributions like Geeks and Nix are the best way to go if you're actually trying to craft a system because you, you lock in the actual configuration. You don't have to try to like reconfigure it every single time you set up a new computer. So I still want to go more deeply into Geeks, uh, covering things like managing your dot files with Geeks Home. That's like a fully untapped area. I mean, obviously Andrew Tropin, who wrote Geeks Home and uh, writes the RDE repo, which has a lot of home services and whatnot, he's covered things on his channel. But I still think that that feature isn't being used by very many people and um, I think that if I can try to find a good way to cover it, then it might get a lot more uptake because I think it's great. I think it's a really good idea and better than using like Sto or something like that to manage your, your dot files because you have more control over how things get placed and uh, configuring sort of the nuts and bolts of programs uh, in a reproducible way. So uh, Geeks Home will be a big thing. I've got a lot of work to do to, to improve my own Geeks Home setup. That's probably one of the first things I'll do when I get back into hacking my stuff is clean up the mess that I created because I've got like three different programs managing my dot files right now and I can't remember which one is, is setting which files up. So I need to really just go 100% into Geeks Home and uh, fix all that up. But um, that won't be a big, big deal for the Geeks coverage. Also, uh, Geeks Shell for isolated development environments. Um, I used Geek Shell extensively for all the stuff that I was doing on Flux Harmonic. Every time you saw me doing coding on Flux Harmonic, I was using Geek Shell. I was actually running it inside of the um, uh, MX compile uh, command, which is actually something I need to cover here. Uh, MX compile. <coughs> um, awesome way to set up isolated development environments where you can run a compiler and have all your libraries set up. You don't need to pollute your normal system configuration with that. Uh, how to package software, especially pre-built software for other distros. I mean, one of the 
problems you could say Geeks has is that it doesn't have as much software as Nix or other Linux distributions does. And that's just because people haven't had time or knowledge to go and package that software. Now, um, you can figure out how to package software that needs to be compiled that's open source or free software and you can easily get the components together to do that. But, uh, my daughter's looking at me right now through the window. Uh, the uh, software that's been already compiled for another Linux distribution, let's say you find an RPM or a .deb file that you know somebody put together a program for some other distribution, to actually take that binary for the program and gather all its dependencies and try to make a Geeks package out of it, I wanna figure out how to do that really well because um, that might unlock Geeks for a lot of people who don't really want to have to go figure out how to compile all these programs from scratch, especially if they're, they are um, proprietary programs that you don't have the source uh, access to, like let's say Slack or something like that. Um, it would be better if you could package up the pre-built version of Slack and tweak it so that it works in Geeks. And it's possible to do that because they do it on, on Nix all the time. Uh, let me see what people are saying in the chat right now. Uh, Brian says Geeks Home is fantastic. Yeah, it's great. Uh, Amal says, I would love to try Geeks, but I'm reluctant to start over given I, ha I have a setup that I really like. Well, if you have a setup that you like, there's no reason to change it, honestly. <laughs> Case says, do a video on discord.el, which is a Discordian calendar package. I think it would just confuse everyone. Uh, Gavin says, I've wanted to try using Geeks as a build system. Um, so there's a lot of common list packages on Geeks. Uh, for SBCL. I think there's some other uh, com common list implementations like maybe ECL that have uh, packages in Geeks, but SBCL has a lot of uh, packages in the Geeks repo because Nixt, is it Nixt? Yeah, Nixt is, um, one of the main developers is uh, Ambervar, Pierre Neidhart, or Neidhart, and uh, he's a prolific Geeks user, or at least was at some point. I don't really know what's going on with him these days because he sort of deleted his presence from the internet. But uh, uh, he has packaged a significant amount of SBCL um, compiled or prepared common list packages. So uh, doing common list development on Geeks is actually pretty good, I think. Case says, maybe I should try Geeks. It's, it's another can of worms for sure. Gavin says people have even packaged some of my lists for geeks. Yeah, that's the thing is like, if you make something that's worthwhile, people will often try to package it for geeks. Star7 says communicating with mobile from geeks, such as get notification lists, call SMS history, similar to Apple ecosystem. I mean, I think that uh, some of the KDE or GNOME tools could do that. I think they have some kind of like apps you can install on your phone where you could like SMS people from your desktop, but I don't really use those. So I don't know much about it. Let's see. Uh, Tomas says, does Geeks have an equivalent of Nix Flakes or is it still reliant on channels or layers? I don't really know what Flakes are, to be honest. If anybody can explain that to me, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, it's, it's ba basically reliant on uh, channels. Yes, Case says KDE Connect, but, but for me, it's janky. Yeah, I mean, pretty much any free software that you use is going to be janky to some degree, right? Uh, Barcer says, thanks for your Emacs videos. Emacs has finally spoiled me. I'm not nearly as productive in any other editor or IDE. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. And I agree. I think uh, other editors and IDEs can be productive, but you don't really become one with the environment like you do with Emacs. I mean, Vim definitely is in a similar territory, but uh, other programs, they're not made for you to make the environment your own. They're made for you to follow their workflow. Gavin says, I, if I recall, flakes are kind of like package build from files, but Nix, okay. Uh, Case says, maybe a video on writing in Emacs. Uh, yeah, probably, but maybe you should do that because I know that you do a lot of writing in Emacs. Make a video on writing in Emacs and I will, I will help you promote it. Uh, Luis says, in Geeks, you can easily lock the channels with Time Machine. Um, I don't see the benefit of Flakes at this point. Yeah, I, I really like uh, Geeks Time Machine. It's awesome. Uh, really cool tool. <laughs> okay. 
So let's see what else. Uh, deploying and managing your own cloud server with Geeks. This is something I've actually done recently. Um, like I mentioned, I set up an XMPP server and I did that with Geeks. I did it on the Vulture cloud host. Um, a lot of times what that requires is starting with, well, no, actually I created a, uh, a geek system, either ISO or VM image, and I uh, uploaded it into Vulture, and then I started the system and it just started running. So uh, it is pretty possible these days to create a geek uh, server system configuration on your machine and test it on your machine using QMU and then deploy it to a cloud server and then continue to like push configuration updates to it. It's pretty awesome actually. So uh, that's something I wanna get more into myself because there's a lot of things I would like to um, host on a cloud server, like things that might be useful to the community or things for myself or whatever. So um, that's something I will cover at some point for sure. Uh, Alejandro says, I wrote, a, I wrote a novel, not published in org mode. It's great to write. Yeah, you know, there's that's something, something I also want to spend time on uh, for System Crafters is writing some books about some of these topics as well because videos are great and all, but sometimes like the organization of the content in a book and the ability to sort of just follow it at your own pace and, you know, refer to things, uh, it's, it's, it, it has benefits on uh, what you get from, uh, from books, or sorry, from videos. And I would also like to see your novel, Alejandro. Uh, Arya says, uh, NixOS has some hacks for converting Debian to NixOS, useful for VPS providers like OVH who don't allow custom ISO. Yeah, that's what you have to do for Geeks on some places. You have to actually take a Debian VM and convert it into Geeks, which is possible, but I don't know. It's better to just be able to create something directly. Case says, I would like some more uh, org site videos. Yeah. Uh, someone in, in Libra chat said that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we need to, to do some more of those. Okay. Um, so I would also like to eventually cover more interesting programs and Linux distributions also. Like, you know, covering Gentoo would be pretty cool because I think Gentoo is awesome. But uh, the problem with Gentoo is I can't show myself setting up a Gentoo system because you would have to wait until everything compiles, uh, which obviously is the same problem with Geeks because it takes forever to install Geek systems sometimes. Uh, but... You know, I wouldn't necessarily go through like a full, how do you use this distro? But, you know, just for my own entertainment and curiosity, I would like to make, you know, videos on uh, like Gentoo and Slackware and maybe some of the older classic Linux distros. Definitely not like, you know, Fedora or Ubuntu or anything that's sort of mainstream because those aren't as interesting to me, but things that are more amenable to system crafting, I think is pretty awesome. And uh, yeah, like what else would you all be interested to see in terms of like video content or programs that I cover or Emacs packages that I haven't thought about? Um, I mean, I've got a lot of good suggestions here, but I'm thinking of like of anything else or any other realm that I haven't looked into yet. I mean, shells is one area we could talk about. Uh, E-shell, or let me, let me just write that down. I need to get back to that. So uh, a full set of videos on E-shell because that's a whole topic that needs to be covered. Um, but maybe, uh, uh, other shells like fish, uh, ZSH, new shell, which we mentioned before on this channel. Uh, Alejandro says directory specific configuration for org Rome is a good topic. Hmm. Yeah. Like having your own sort of uh, special org Rome folder, like directory specific config for org Rome. We put that right under where is it? There we go. Go. There you go. Wow. Smoke says, I usually use ANSI, ANSI term, all hail bash. Yeah, bash is fine. I use bash uh, whenever I'm not using e shell. Um, someone asks, but geeks will finally change to the herd kernel, right? No, that's, that's sort of a joke. Um, that was like an April Fool's post they did. However, they did do a lot of work last year, I think, in getting. Uh, geeks to work with the herd kernel. So it's, it's not a joke in the sense that it does actually work today, but herd itself, I don't think it runs on actual hardware. I think that it only runs in VMs at this point. So um, it's not going to be a priority. It's, it's going to be, you know, Linux all the time for sure. 
Uh, Tomas says e, uh, ES shell because it doesn't have coding issues and supports, supports first class functions. Interesting. Uh, Jeff says Gentoo needs a cluster of machines to distribute the compiling of packages. Yeah, I know, right? And Tomas says life is short, focus on geeks. Well, you know, thing about geeks is that it, it is pretty niche compared to other distros. So making videos on other distros could be a way to sort of um, catch people who wouldn't ordinarily look for the other topics I talk about. So there, there's sort of reasons for me to make videos about other programs that are more outside of the sphere of what we normally do. Um, good for sort of people to find the channel, I think. <laughs> Alejandro says, Herd is a non-ending investigation pro uh, project. Yeah, it kind of is, isn't it? Uh, Will says, improving EWW setup. That's a good point. Um, let's see. Uh, improving EWW setup. I would like to use EWW more because it's pretty interesting. Um, obviously, you know, most websites won't render correctly with it, but there's things like, what's it called? SHM face. Um, that is a package you can use that improves the way EWW looks. I think I've heard of that before. So yeah, EWW would be a cool thing to cover uh, once in a while. Like, you know, browse your websites with Emacs. Uh, Thomas says, how to get Emacs pro and cons to compile from scratch. Use built-in package manager, flat pack. Um, oh yeah, okay, yep. So how to build latest Emacs from scratch. Uh, on various distros, I guess, or various OSs, I guess is a better way to say that. Yeah, because I actually have been meaning to make a video on that because, you know, if you want to try Emacs 29, you're definitely not going to find a binary for that in your distro, so you would have to compile it. Aria says, ThinkPad X60, 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 I can't speak, can run herd if I recall. Wow, that's pretty, uh, pretty impressive. So, hey, Meadow. Hey, Meadow. Um, Amato says, uh, Gile Emacs is dead. Native compile, mostly superseded Gile Emacs. Use Cade need to exist. Yeah, for sure. And that was a response to, uh, build on angst. Uh, Gile Emacs would be interesting to look into, especially for Geeks users. Yeah, Gile Emacs is definitely not, um, proceeding, I think. K says, have you covered writing your own major mode? I had started doing that for the Emacs Lisp series, and, um... I mean, the most common reason you would need to make a major mode is to do syntax highlighting for a language, and that's like a whole can of worms that <laughs> I don't know that I'm really uh, interested to cover. Font locking is kind of wild. Um, and then to cover, to make any other kind of major mode, like making your own custom interface in Emacs, I mean, there's a lot of work involved in that too. It just didn't seem worth it, but if people are interested in seeing a video like that, I'll f certainly consider it. Uh, Abraham Viva says, how to make your own space max, the logic and how to set up in the simplest way. Well, we're sort of doing that right now with Rational Emacs. Uh, so you should probably check out the streams I did on that and also the Rational Emacs repo. Uh, if you just Google Rational Emacs, I think it probably shows up first. Rational Emacs. Let's see. Uh, well, I mean, this is Google. Probably it, it knows me. So it uh, is suggesting things near to things I've already searched for. Uh, SHR face. Thank you. Thank you to Brian there. SHR face. <coughs> Emacs application framework. Yeah. Could be. Um, take a look at that. Emacs application framework. More as like a curiosity. I mean, it'd be kind of nice to use that day to day, but I feel like I've heard it doesn't work well with EXWM, but I think somebody else told me on the stream once that that's not actually true. So I don't know. Uh, John says, maybe cover writing minor modes to add some kind of global functionality. I did in the um, Emacs Lisp series. I think it was actually the lowest viewed video of the series, which is kind of why I'm hesitant to write a major mode video. <laughs> My, minor modes are great, um, and they're not very hard to write. Gavin says, take a look at Nix. It's my most recent obsession. Every time that I've used Nix, I just couldn't get it set up in a way that I liked. It just felt clunky to me. And that's not a knock on the developers. I mean, what they're trying to do is pretty awesome, but um, it's difficult to do what they're trying to do. And especially if you're using WebKit GTK, which is just not a good renderer. Um, I don't know, like it, I can't really use uh, Nixt. Gavin says, literally making a PR a day at this rate. That's cool. I'm glad to hear that you're contributing to it. I, I have not really, um, I've tried using Nixt like three or four times and I always 
give it up after like, you know, two hours. But if you have any tips or pointers, I'd be happy to hear those too. Matto says, e would be cool. It's my daily driver and it's very powerful, mostly misunderstood. Spoiler, you can use Emacs own cap FS as a completion mechanism, trouncing all the other completion styles. Yes. Um, and I believe that recently, uh, Minad, Daniel Mindler, who did Vertico and a lot of other packages, has been playing around with eShell, if I'm not mistaken. I think I saw him talking to other people on the Doom Emacs uh, Discord about that. So uh, eShell might be getting some love soon, which would be really awesome if so. Gavin says it's rough with EXWM. Yeah, that's probably part of the reason why I have a problem with it is that it's difficult to context switch between Emacs key bindings and then the key bindings in um, Nixt because it's basically, you know, Emacs replicated into a browser, effectively. Yes, exactly what uh, Alejandro said. Um, okay. So if you have other ideas in the future about uh, what you would like to see on the channel, let me know. I'm really appreciative for all the ideas and feedback that people have been giving so far in the stream. Um, but yeah, I've got a lot of stuff, obviously, that I can cover. So I'm interested to get into some area of this stuff and start making videos because... Uh, uh, there's a lot of fun stuff to do. So, uh, Friday streams. I want to talk about what I want to do with Friday streams going forward. Um, and like I said before, these streams have basically been the primary way I've kept the channel going without making videos for six months. And it's been a very useful function for me to just like have something out on the channel and interact with people on the channel um, without having to spend a lot of time or think really deeply on a topic. But on the flip side, it's been very, very difficult to continue thinking of things to do. And that's sort of the reason why some weeks I just wasn't streaming because I just literally didn't have anything to say. I don't have anything to talk about because I've been busy with other projects or I don't really work on anything new with my configuration, etc. And, you know, I like I mentioned before, over time, I realized that I'm also using up, you know, actual video topics that would actually be good for a video on streams. It doesn't mean I can't make a video about it also, but I can't make a video very soon after about the same thing because it just seems a little bit lame. Um, but I don't know, that's just sort of me. I, I've got a lot of stupid ideas about how things should work, which are wrong often. Uh, so I can't say that it's, it's the right perspective to have, but that is the reason why. Um, so I would like to change how we do the Friday streams, not necessarily like do them entirely differently it will basically be the same format i mean me talking to you we're all, all talking in the chat here i'm uh you know responding to things people say in the chat etc but i want to focus more on that more on the community side of things and maybe focus more on some of those types of things i don't i couldn't do as easily in normal videos so things like the dot file detective thing that i did twice and never really went back to mainly because i psyched myself out uh, by thinking, oh, you know, I should actually invite the person onto the stream to talk about their config on voice chat or video chat. But, you know, scheduling things with people is difficult because if they can't meet you at the time of your stream, then you either have to move the stream or you have to pre-record things and either of those are not really good options. So it, I was sort of hesitant to do that, but I may have to just do it anyway. But um, I think it's really cool to look at other people's configurations and sort of put a spotlight on things they do that are really interesting or maybe um, unexpected or just like, you know, nice looking configuration files, nice directory layout, you know, just, you know, silly stuff like that that we all find cool. So that would be something I would certainly do, <coughs> excuse me, that would, I would certainly do more of on the streams. Uh, Bildungsangst says, as a new crafter, I basically thought your Friday streams are the videos. Well, they started out that way. Um, Back in 20, what year was that? 2020, when I started making the, the first Emacs from Scratch series, the videos actually were streams. I recorded like an, an hour long video about Emacs as a stream. And that worked out pretty well for a while, but then I started getting complaints about video links. So I started trying to do pre-recorded videos and then the Friday stream switched to something else, uh, this format basically. So most of what you've been seeing getting posted to the channel over the past few months has been stream recordings, which is unfortunate, but I'm going to change that now. Um, oh, yeah. Jeff says uh, temp and skeleton. You're talking about uh, templates, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, let me go add that because those are some things I do want to cover. I keep forgetting. Let's go right up here. Um, so templating in Emacs, uh, tempo.el. Uh, what was the other one called? 
<laughs> there's also skeleton. Then I like uh, temple by, um, well, I'll just call it temple by uh, Minad. It's pretty awesome. Let's see. Uh, retracing says, how about covering remote access protocols? Maybe, I, I don't really use it as much, so it's not something that I have a whole lot of experience with. Uh, Nicholas says, would Rust ever make its way into the eLisp interpreter or Emacs? I mean, th there's a chance that, um, I think I've heard people saying that they would be pulling in Rust-based modules into Emacs, maybe because People have been talking about bringing tree sitter into Emacs, and I think that the, some of the core stuff for tree sitter is written in Rust, if I'm not mistaken. So that could be an entry point for Rust getting into uh, the Emacs build, but it complicates things a lot. If you try to bring in another compiler tool, tool chain that has its own way of compiling for different platforms, then it becomes like a real headache. So I don't know how easy that's going to be. Matto says, I doubt it. Most of the Emacs core are old timers that literally know nothing about Rust. And to be honest, adding Rust into the equation would complicate an already complicated build system. Exactly. Yeah, it's it would be really complicated, I think. Jeff says, I've switched using using Tempo with Abreves and Skeletons instead of using Yasnippet. That's awesome. <coughs> All right. Um, what else did I have here? Um, bring people onto the stream to discuss topics like Emacs package authors or other interesting people, or even people from the community to talk about various things. I mean, it would be interesting to have a dialogue with people and not just me sitting here talking to you for two hours. Um, someone mentioned, uh, interviewing Alpha Papa. I'd certainly be interested to talk to Alpha Papa and also to Minad. Uh, I've, I've been trying to schedule something with, uh, Silhouse for a while, but, uh, I let that fall off because I was busy with other things. So I, I could probably get that back together if he's still willing to do it. Um, but yeah, other people as well, you know, like we could talk to anybody, really anybody that people thought was interesting. I actually got, um, on Twitter one day, someone suggested to me that I should, uh, talk to certain people like John Weigley and Andy Wingo, who's like the, one of the main maintainers, maybe just the main maintainer of Guile scheme and, uh, has done a lot of stuff on Guile and maybe even geeks to some degree. Uh, and, and they added Andy on that tweet and he liked it. So I, I assume that means that he would probably be interested in being interviewed or talked to me on the stream. So that'd be cool because, uh, Andy knows a lot about, uh, scheme obviously, but also about, you know, program language development in general. So that'd be really cool. Uh, let's see. Okay. So Luis says that only the tree sitter CLI uses rust. If I recall the libs and C that sounds more like it. Yeah. Star7 says, can we run Emacs inside a browser? I see a lot of VS code running inside the web browser. There is a way to do that. Somebody managed to compile Emacs to the browser using mscripten. Um, and it sort of works, but I don't think it's something you would want to use. Uh, Maddo says, uh, the best thing to happen to Rust is the cargo-free build system in Geeks. That's cool. I haven't looked into that. I can see how it would, it would work, but uh, yeah. I was wondering how they were going to deal with cargo, but maybe if they just eliminated that from the equation, it's much better. Which I guess you kind of have to do. Uh, Matto also says, if you're talking about templating, also do cover K macros. They're mostly related to use case and nearly nobody talks about them. I don't know what they are, so I'll do that. Never heard of it. Uh, and lastly, I would like to spotlight cool things that the community is doing. I mean, obviously, I need to talk more about what's happening with the Rational Emacs because that prog project is progressing, which is really awesome to see. Um, but also, like, anybody who's making either Emacs packages or other related tools, Lisp libraries, interesting programs, anything like that, uh, or writing Geeks packages, whatever. Like, I want to spotlight things in, that people in the community are doing. So if... Um, if you are working on something new that you've just released, maybe you're not really ready for people to try it yet, but maybe you want people to at least see that it exists. Let me know either on the system, system excuse me, I can't speak anymore. I, obviously I need to eat some food. Uh, the System Crafters Discord, there's a channel, um, what's it called, Share Your Work? Where is it? I'm pulling up the Discord. Yeah, Share Your Work. There's a channel called Share Your Work in the System Crafters Discord. If you go there, 
then um, <clears throat> post links to the stuff that you're working on and I might pull some of those things in and, and talk about them on Friday streams. Um, or just, you know, send me an email or, I mean, I'm, I'm terrible about not replying to emails. I've probably mentioned that before. Um, but yeah, I want to cover things like that. And, you know, even bringing people from the community on to the streams to talk about stuff. I mean, like I probably you should, you know, chat with Gavin on the stream at some point about common list, because I haven't really used common list in a while. It might be interesting to talk about it. So just anything like that, like we, we should, you know, have more people on or more people's stuff being talked about rather than me just like, you know, talking about whatever is on my mind that day, because I think it's going to be more fun that way. I, I, I keep saying system crackers community, <clears throat> uh, in, in relation to this channel and, and everything else. And I really want people to feel like it is a community. And I, I think that people do to some degree, because there's a lot of people that have, that have been with us for a while now, which I'm very thankful for. Um, and I think the only reason why is because of the community and the fact that, you know, there's a presence when the videos are not being posted or the stream is not on. So <clears throat> I, I wanted to sort of push that even further, I guess, with the streams. Auntie Carol says, shells, uh, X-O-N-S-H. Well, I don't know what X-O-N-S-H, but let me go put that in the list. I haven't heard of that. Uh, and mentioning the Discord and IRC, I want to be more active there again because I haven't been active at all. Uh, and I'm very thankful to the people who have been helping me moderate those uh, spaces and the others who have been contributing, you know, like helping people with questions or, you know, posting interesting stuff, that kind of thing, because <clears throat> it's difficult to be in in uh, you know the communities that you're in sometimes whenever your mind is elsewhere and whatnot just like you don't have anything interesting to say so uh, i want to be back in there and use a lot of the stuff that we're talking about in those communities on the streams so i think it will be uh fun to do that <clears throat> excuse me and uh alejandro mentioned uh before um maybe scheme guile and mesh and mx compile with mesh yeah mesh you know it I'm, I'm sort of like trying to figure out what that language should be best at because I basically just re-implemented Scheme effectively, but without all the features. So, you know, a lot of the core stuff from Scheme is in Mesh, but um, <clears throat> if I'm going to use it for making my own tools, I might want to like have a different sort of focus area. And I'm sort of trying to figure out what that is right now. I'm, I'm thinking it's sort of going to be a language that's really good for interactive tool development. Um, but it is something that I would talk about at some point on this channel because it might be useful to people here. It's just a matter of, you know, figuring out what the use case is. But uh, MX compiled with Mesh, yeah, I basically was just using uh, Geek Shell and uh, Mesh Build for that. So if any of you, like Alejandro, have been watching uh, Flux Harmonic, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Matta says, another thing is hooking up real good with with DAP. Interesting. I didn't know you could do that. So Tomas says, I haven't seen a good uh, workflow with explanations for Emacs CIDR to work with Clojure. That's interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. Ah, put that in the wrong place. Um... What was that? Uh, setting up DAP with real good. And then uh, what was the other thing? Uh, yeah, Tomas says uh, Emacs CIDR workflow for closure. Yeah. And we do need to cover Guile scheme at some point for geeks people. Debugging on Emacs GDB. Yeah, I mean, I did use GDB quite a lot actually recently. Um, using GDB uh, in Emacs or uh, whatever languages GDB works with. Um, Eric says, uh, you might test Emacs collaborative editing. You could have edited your org file today online. Ah, that's a good, good idea. With a select count of contributors, also giving read-only access to users would allow everybody to read the whole doc. Yeah, actually, that's a good idea. Um, I think there's a crdt.el package. Um, or collaborative editing. That would be interesting to take a look at that in a video and even possibly use it for streams. 
Um, Kay says, another thing, using MX compile and MX package compile and making those smarter. There's a package compile? I haven't seen that before. What is Matto talking about? Matto says, I'm making progress, though. I don't know what that was in reference to. Uh, Tomas says, there are a billion ways to evaluate an express expression in CIDR, but it's unclear how to combine them in, in a good workflow, especially for pair programming. That's interesting. I haven't thought about that. Uh, it, that's, is that it? Yeah, I think that's it. So yeah, that was a whole bunch of talking about what things I should be doing. So let's see if I actually do them, huh? Uh, <laughs> I think that we're good, though. Like, I, I enjoy, you know system crafting i mean system crafting system crafting is sort of a bs concept that i made up but I, I enjoy tinkering with my configuration and working with different programs and stuff so i'm looking forward to getting back into that and making a lot of videos for this channel um i might just dive into this list wherever seems the most interesting to me in the short term and try to just get back into the flow of making videos again so if i don't make a video on a topic that you were sort of looking forward to just um, let me know if you really want to see something specific, but I'll, I'm just going to try to get back into this flow of making videos regularly the best that I can. So it will, it will have to be doing videos on things that are immediately interesting to me. So it might be something like Herb stuff, Herb stuff, WM or BSBWM, or it might be geeks home, it might be stuff like that. I just need to get something going. So uh, my, my goal, my, my dedication to you is that there will be a video next week. I can't say what it's going to be, but there will be a video for sure. The last time I said that, it didn't happen, but there are various reasons why that didn't happen. But this time it's going to happen for sure. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, if you have any other ideas for me, um, definitely leave them in the comments after the stream is over. I'm actually going to end the stream a little bit early today because I've got to go have dinner with some folks. But... Um, uh, Matto says YouTube chat is not sending all my messages. Yeah, if you posted the links, it probably ate them. Uh, Camelo says another idea: how to become a system crafter if one starts as a web dev, as an example. That's a good idea. Um, so yeah, let me know if you have other ideas. I'm always happy to hear it. Uh, also, you could you know find me on Discord, IRC, etc., um, or send an email if you want. And uh, yeah, we'll get started next week. Um, on a new video and maybe next week I'll try to do something different in the streams. Maybe I can try to get somebody on to chat with me or maybe we'll do a dot file detective. Uh, if you want to have your configuration analyzed on stream one week, uh, definitely also send me a link to that uh, if you're willing to be a guinea pig in that uh, in that way. But typically what I've been doing is finding the configurations of people that I thought were interesting like Angry Bacon and um, Tekasaur, which we did last year or yeah, maybe last year. And I might go find some others that I find interesting uh, to talk about. But uh, yeah, those things we definitely should do more of. And uh, I'll start getting those scheduled soon. But like I said, that's going to be it for today. I'm going to go eat some uh, delicious souvlaki right now. If you, if you know what that is, you know that I'm in for a treat. So um, I thank you all for being here. I really appreciate uh, everybody's uh, interest and suggestions. I'm going to do a lot of these things. I'm also going to uh, commit these show notes. Uh, Matto says definitely add Omar to that list. There's some crazy stuff he does. Yes, that's a good idea. Um, so you can check the show notes out in the description and whenever I get them committed up. And until next time, thanks so much for being here and uh, happy hacking. We'll see you.